Chapter 3 The thought instantly occurred to me that the paper was a note from Augustus, and that some unaccountable accident having happened to prevent his relieving me from my dungeon, he had devised this method of acquainting me with the true state of affairs. Trembling with eagerness, I now commenced another search for my phosphorus matches and tapers. I had a confused recollection of having put them carefully away just before falling asleep, and indeed, previously to my last journey to the trap, I had been able to remember the exact spot where I had deposited them. But now I endeavored in vain to call it to mind, and busied myself for a full hour in fruitless and vexatious search for the missing articles. Never surely was there a more tantalizing state of anxiety and suspense. At length, while groping about, with my head close to the ballast, near the opening of the box and outside of it, I perceived a faint glimmering of light in the direction of the steerage. Greatly surprised, I endeavored to make my way toward it, as it appeared to be but a few feet from my position. Scarcely had I moved with this intention, when I lost sight of the glimmer entirely, and, before I could bring it into view again, was obliged to fill along by the box until I had exactly resumed my original situation. Now, moving my head with caution to and fro, I found that by proceeding slowly, with great care, in an opposite direction to that in which I had first started, I was enabled to draw near the light, still keeping it in view. Presently I came directly upon it, having squeezed my way through innumerable narrow windings, and found that it proceeded from some fragments of my matches lying in an empty barrel turned up upon its side. I was wondering how they came in such a place, when my hand fell upon two or three pieces of taper wax, which had been evidently mumbled by the dog. I concluded at once that he had devoured the whole of my supply of candles, and I felt hopeless of being ever able to read the note of Augustus. The small remnants of the wax were so mashed up among the rubbish in the barrel that I despaired of deriving any service from them, and left them as they were. The phosphorus, of which there was only a speck or two, I gathered up as well I could, and returned with it, after much difficulty to my box, where Tiger had all the while remained. What to do next I could not tell. The hold was so intensely dark that I could not see my hand, however close I would hold it to my face. The white slip of paper could barely be discerned, and not even that when I looked at it directly. By turning the exterior portions of the retina toward it, that is to say by surveying it slightly askance, I found that it became in some measure perceptible. Thus the gloom of my prison may be imagined, and the note of my friend, if indeed it were a note from him, seemed only likely to throw me into further trouble by disquieting to no purpose my already enfeebled and agitated mind. In vain I resolved in my brain a multitude of absurd expeditions for procuring light, such expeditions precisely as a man in the perturbed sleep occasioned by opium would be apt to fall upon for a similar purpose, each and all of which appear by turns to the dreamer the most reasonable and the most preposterous of conceptions, just as the reasoning or imaginative faculties flicker alternately, one above the other. At last an idea occurred to me which seemed rational, which gave me cause to wonder, very justly, that I had not entertained it before. I placed the slip of paper on the back of a book, and, collecting the fragments of the phosphorus matches which I had brought from the barrel, laid them together upon the paper. I then, with the palm of my hand, rubbed the hole over quickly yet steadily, a clear light diffused itself immediately throughout the whole surface, and had there been any writing upon it, I should not have experienced the least difficulty, I am sure, in reading it. Not a syllable was there, however, nothing but a dreary and unsatisfactory blank. The illumination died away in a few seconds, and my heart within me as it went. I have before stated more than once that my intellect, for some period prior to this, had been in a condition nearly bordering on idiocy. There were, to be sure, momentary intervals of perfect sanity, and, now and then, even of energy, but these were few. 
It must be remembered that I had been, for many days certainly, inhaling the almost pestilential atmosphere of a close hold in a whaling vessel, and for a long portion of that time, but scantily supplied with water. For the last fourteen or fifteen hours I had none, nor had I slept during that time. Salt provisions of the most exciting kind had been my chief, and indeed since the loss of my mutton, my only supply of food, with the exception of the sea biscuit, and these later were utterly useless to me, as they were too dry and hard to be swallowed in the swollen and parched condition of my throat. I was now in a high state of fever, and in every respect exceedingly ill. This will account for the fact that many miserable hours of despondency elapsed after my last adventure with the phosphorus, before the thought suggested itself that I had examined only one side of the paper. I shall not attempt to describe my feelings of rage, for I believe I was more angry than anything else, when the agrarious oversight that I committed flashed suddenly upon my perception. The blunder itself would have been unimportant, had not my own folly and impetuosity rendered it otherwise. In my disappointment at not finding some words upon the slip, I had childishly torn it to pieces and thrown it away. It was impossible to say where. From the worst part of this dilemma, I was relieved by the sagacity of Tiger. Having got, after a long search, a small piece of the note, I put it to the dog's nose and endeavored to make him understand that he must bring me the rest of it. To my astonishment, for I had taught him none of the usual tricks for which his breed are famous, he seemed to enter at once into my meaning, and rummaging about for a few moments, soon found another considerable portion. Bringing me this, he paused a while, and, rubbing his nose against my hand, appeared to be waiting for my approval of what he had done. I patted him on the head when he immediately made off again. It was now some minutes before he came back, but when he did come, he brought with him a large slip, which proved to be all the paper missing, it having been torn, it seems, only into three pieces. Luckily, I had no trouble in finding what few fragments of the phosphorus were left, being guided by the indistinct glow one or two of the particles still emitted. My difficulties had taught me the necessity of caution and I now took time to reflect upon what I was about to do. It was very probable, I considered, that some words were written upon that side of the paper which had not been examined. But which side was that? Fitting the pieces together gave me no clue in this respect, although it assured me that the words, if there were any, would be found all on one side, and connected in a proper manner as written. There was a greater necessity of ascertaining the point in question beyond a doubt, as the phosphorus remaining would be altogether insufficient for a third attempt, should I fail in the one I was about to now make. I placed the paper on a book as before, and sat for some minutes thoughtfully, re revolving the matter over in my mind. At last I thought it barely possible that the written side might have some unevenness on its surface, which a delicate sense of feeling might enable me to detect. I determined to make the experiment, and passed my finger very carefully over the side which first presented itself. Nothing, however, was perceptible, and I turned the paper, adjusting it on the book. I now again carried my forefinger cautiously along, when I was aware of an exceedingly slight but still discernible glow which followed as I proceeded. This, I knew, must arise from some very minute remaining particles of the phosphorus, with which I had covered the paper in my previous attempt. The other, or underside, then, was that on which lay the writing, if there should finally prove to be. Again I turned the note, and went to work as I had previously done. Having rubbed in the phosphorus, a brilliancy ensued as before, but this time several lines of MS in a large hand, and appeared in red ink, became distinctly visible. The glimmer, although sufficiently bright, was but momentary. Still, had I not been too greatly excited, there would have been ample time enough for me to peruse the whole three sentences before me, for I saw there were three. In my anxiety, however, to read all at once, I succeeded only in reading the seven concluding words, which thus appeared, Blood, your life depends upon lying close.
Had I been able to ascertain the entire contents of the note, the full meaning of the admonition which my friend had thus attempted to convey, that admonition, even though it should have revealed a story of disaster the most unspeakable, could not, I am firmly convinced, have imbued my mind with one tithe of the harrowing yet indefinable horror with which I was inspired by the fragmentary warning thus received. And blood, too, that word of all words, so rife at all times with mystery and suffering and terror, how trebly full of importance did it now appear, how chilly and heavily, disjointed as it thus was from any foregoing words to quantify or render it distinct, did its vague syllables fall amid the deep gloom of my prison into the innermost recesses of my soul. Augustus had, undoubtedly, good reasons for wishing me to remain concealed, and I formed a thousand surmises as to what they could be, but I could think of nothing affording a satisfactory solution of the mystery. Just after returning from my last journey to the trap, and before my attention had been otherwise directed by the singular conduct of Tiger, I had come to the resolution of making myself heard at all events by those on board, or, if I could not succeed in this directly, of trying to cut my way through the Orlop deck. The half-certainty with which I felt to being able to accomplish one of these two purposes in the last emergency had given me courage, which I should not otherwise have had to endure the evils of my situation. The few words I had been able to read, however, had cut me off from these final resources, and I now, for the first time, felt all the misery of my fate. In a paroxysm of despair, I threw myself again upon the mattress, where, for about the period of a day and night, I lay in a kind of stupor, relieved only by momentary intervals of reason and recollection. At length I once more arose, and busied myself in reflection upon the horrors which encompassed me. For another twenty-four hours it was barely possible that I might exist without water. For a longer time I could not do so. During the first portion of my imprisonment I had made free use of the cordials with which Augustus had supplied me, but they only served to excite fever, without in the least degree assaging thirst. I had now only about a gill left and this was of a species of strong peach liqueur, at which my stomach revolted. The sausages were entirely consumed. Of the ham, nothing remained but a small piece of the skin, and all the biscuit, except a few fragments of one, had been eaten by tiger. To add to my troubles, I found that my headache was increasing momentarily, and with the species of delirium, which had distressed me more or less since my first falling asleep. For some hours past it had been with the greatest difficulty I could breathe at all, and now each attempt at doing so was attended with the most depressing spasmodic action of the chest. But there was still another and very different source of disquietude, and one indeed whose harassing terrors had been the chief means of arousing me to exertion from my stupor on the mattress. It arose from the demeanor of the dog. I first observed an alteration in his conduct while rubbing in the phosphorus on the paper in my last attempt. As I rubbed, he ran his nose against my hand with a slight snarl, but I was too greatly excited at the time to pay much attention to the circumstance. Soon afterward, it will be remembered, I threw myself on the mattress and fell into a species of lethargy. Presently I became aware of a singular hissing sound close to my ears, and discovered it to proceed from Tiger who was panting and wheezing in a state of the greatest apparent excitement, his eyeballs flashing fiercely through the gloom. I spoke to him, when he replied with a low growl and then remained quiet. Presently I relapsed into my stupor, from which I was again awakened in a similar manner. This was repeated three or four times, until finally his behavior inspired me with so great a degree of fear that I became fully aroused. He was now lying close by the door of the box, snarling fearfully, although in a kind of undertone, and grinding his teeth as if strongly convulsed. I had no doubt whatever that the want of water or the confined atmosphere of the hold had driven him mad, and I was at a loss what could course to pursue. I could not endure the thought of killing him, yet it seemed absolutely necessary for my own safety. I could distinctly perceive his eyes fastened upon me with an expression of the most deadly animosity, 
and I expected every instant that he would attack me. At last I could endure my terrible situation no longer, and determined to make my way from the box at all hazards and dispatch him, if his opposition should render it necessary for me to do so. To get out, I had to pass directly over his body, and he already seemed to anticipate my design, missing himself upon his forelegs, as I perceived by the altered position of his eyes, and displayed the whole of his white fangs, which were easily discernible. I took the remains of the ham skin and the bottle containing the liquor and secured them about my person, together with a large carving knife which Augustus had left me. Then, folding my cloak around me as closely as possible, I made a movement toward the mouth of the box. No sooner did I do this than the dog sprang with a loud growl toward my throat. The whole weight of his body struck me on the right shoulder, and I fell violently to the left, while the enraged animal passed entirely over me. I had fallen upon my knees with my head buried among the blankets, and these protected me from a second furious assault, during which I felt the sharp teeth pressing vigorously upon the wool which now enveloped my neck, yet, luckily, without being able to penetrate all the folds. I was now beneath the dog, and a few moments would place me completely in his power. Despair gave me strength, and I rose boldly up, shaking him from me by main force, and dragging with me the blankets from the mattress. These I now threw over him, and before he could extricate himself, I had got through the door and closed it effectually against his pursuit. In this struggle, however, I had been forced to drop the morsel of ham skin, and I now found my whole stock and provisions reduced to a single gill of liqueur. As this reflection crossed my mind, I felt myself actuated by one of those fits of pervasiveness which might be supposed to influence a spoiled child in simula similar situations, and, raising the bottle to my lips, I drained it to the last drop and dashed it furiously upon the floor. Scarcely had the echo of the crash died away when I heard my name pronounced in an eager but subdued voice, issuing from the direction of the steerage. So unexpected was anything of the kind, and so intense was the emotion excited within me by the sound, that I endeavored in vain to reply. My powers of speech totally failed, and in an agony of terror lest my friend should conclude me dead, and return without attempting to reach me, I stood up between the crates near the door of the box, trembling convulsively, and gasping and struggling for utterance. Had a thousand words depended upon a syllable, I could not have spoken it. There was a slight movement now, audible among the lumber somewhere forward of my station. The sound presently grew less distinct, then again less so, and still less. Shall I forever forget my feelings at this moment? He was going, my friend, my companion, from whom I had a right to expect so much. He was going, he would abandon me, he was gone. He would leave me to perish miserably, to expire in the most horrible and loathsome of dungeons, and one word, one little syllable would save me, yet that single syllable I could not utter. I felt, I am sure, more than ten thousand times the agonies of death itself. My brain reeled, and I fell deadly sick against the end of the box. As I fell, the carving knife was shaken out from the waistband of my pantaloons and dropped with a rattling sound to the floor. Never did any strain of the richest melody come so sweetly to my ears. With the intensest anxiety I listened to ascertain the effect of the noise upon Augustus, for I knew that the person who called my name could be no one but himself. All was silent for some moments. At length I again heard the word, Arthur, repeated in a low tone, and one full of hesitation. Reviving hope loosened at once my powers of speech, and I now screamed at the top of my voice, Augustus! Oh, Augustus! Hush, for God's sake, be silent, he replied, in a voice trembling with agitation. I will be with you immediately, as soon as I can make my way through the hold. For a long time I heard him moving among the lumber, and every moment seemed to me an age. At length I felt his hand upon my shoulder, and he placed, at the same moment, a bottle of water to my lips. 
Those only who have been suddenly redeemed from the jaws of the tomb, or who have known the insufferable torments of thirst under circumstances as aggravated as those which encompassed me in my dreary prison, can form any idea of the unutterable transports which that one long drought of the richest of all physical luxuries afforded. When I had, in some degree, satisfied my thirst, Augustus produced from his pocket three or four boiled potatoes, which I devoured with the greatest avidity. He had brought with him a light and a dark lantern, and the grateful rays afforded me scarcely less comfort than the food and drink, but I was impatient to learn the cause of his protracted absence, and he proceeded to recount what had happened on board during my incarceration.